Eliot's legendary poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, tells the disjointed, fragmented story of a man as simultaneously simple and complex as modern life itself. The poem's epigraph is from Dante's Inferno. In Italian, it quotes a character named Guido da Montefeltro, who has been sent to hell for the crime of trying to buy absolution, forgiveness of his sins. Montefeltro is ashamed of his sin and believes his story would be safe with Dante, who he doesn't realize is only a visitor to hell. The poem opens with the titular proof rock proposing that you and I take an evening walk, but it's clear he doesn't see this as a pleasant walk. The night sky looks like a patient etherized upon a table. The streets are half deserted. The neighborhood is sordid and shabby. Proofrock tells his companion not to ask what the question is, but just to come along. Proofrock's walk has taken him to a house where the women inside chat about Michelangelo, the Italian painter and sculptor born in the 15th century. He looks out one of the windows and describes the London fog surrounding the house like a yellow cat that pokes through various dark places and finally curls itself around the house and falls asleep. Proofrock assures himself that there will be time to wonder, do I dare? This is the central question of the poem, although what Proofrock fears to do isn't exactly specified. He decides he does not dare and heads back downstairs. In this vision, he sees himself as well-dressed but imagines no one else notices. Behind his back, people may be whispering about his bald spot and his thin arms and legs. Proofrock asks again, do I dare? But this time he adds, do I dare disturb the universe? The couplet that begins, in the rooms the women come and go, appears twice in this section as a way of signaling Proofrock's circling thoughts. Proofrock knows there is time for decisions and revisions. He's passed long days making resolutions only to change them, spent too much time alone at meaningless social events. He's all too familiar with what it's like to make up his mind and then change it. He feels pinned down by the critical scrutiny of an unspecified audience. The eyes may be female, since Proofrock mentions bracelets and skirts, but they could also belong to any observer he perceives as hostile, or even to the malign glance of the universe itself. Proofrock reflects on his physical attraction to an unnamed woman. He pictures her arms, white and bare from a distance, covered with light brown hair when seen up close. He sees the arms at rest or wrapped around a shawl. He wonders if it's her perfume that makes me so digress. Does he mean he's digressing from the matter at hand, his inner turmoil, or from the chance to speak frankly to the woman? Proofrock tries to formulate what he might actually say, wondering if he should explain the challenges of his journey, that he's passed through narrow, lonely streets and seen other lonely men standing at windows. Stunned by his own passivity and stalling, Proofrock abruptly bursts out with a self-loathing lament. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Proofrock has returned to his circling thoughts and excuses. It's so easy just to do nothing. How, after passing time in such a trivial setting, like a tea party, can he awaken his dormant courage to say or do something forceful or meaningful? He judges himself as worthless, and having passed that judgment, assumes that acting or speaking up could be fatally dangerous. He imagines himself as the biblical Lazarus returning from the dead, trying to explain everything that's happened to him. He wishes he had a magic lantern to project his nerves onto a screen to make their message clear. He wonders again, what if he bears his soul and is then rejected by the one woman? The risk is too great. Proofrock is done trying to ask the question of whether or not he is Hamlet. He concludes that he's no hero in a Shakespeare play, just one of the courtiers in the background, and not a very good one either. Having given up his great mission, Proofrock feels depleted and old, reduced to minutia. Shall he comb his hair over his bald spot? Can he risk eating a peach? He'll hang up his evening clothes, put on some white flannels, and take a walk on the beach. Sometimes on that beach walk, he's seen mermaids singing to one another, but he doesn't think they'll sing to him. He wouldn't understand them. Proofrock has stood on the sand and watched the mermaids. He imagines lingering underwater with them, but then the real world intrudes. When we are yanked out of this make-believe world and return to real life, when human voices pull us out of the dream, forcing us back into the dangerous real world, we drown. This poem is a dramatic monologue, which has three key attributes. The speaker is not the poet, but a person reflecting on the specific situation. The monologue is addressed to another person or people. And the poem serves to reveal the personality and mood of the speaker. As a modernist, T.S. Eliot rejected the notion that poetry needs a strict rhyme scheme or meter. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock achieves a compromise between grand language and obsessive mumbling. Proofrock is filled with illusions, penetrating looks into J. Alfred Proofrock's character. 
Assuming the reader can identify the literary allusions, discovering them briefly halts the narrative flow. This jolting effect, called fragmentation, is intentional on Eliot's part. It's meant to display Prufrock's state of mind as it swerves from idea to idea. Even though the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is a poem, it still has two central characters, J. Alfred Prufrock himself and an unnamed woman. It's fair to say that most adults would say that 40 is barely middle-aged, but J. Alfred Prufrock would surely disagree. In fact, he's ashamed of aging, expressed in his embarrassment over his thinning hair. Maturity seems to have brought him nothing but self-loathing and a fear of intimacy so great he's in a state of emotional paralysis. Though he has known the arms already, known them all, arms of beautiful women, he does not dare to share his most intimate thoughts for fear of rejection. Prufrock appears to be well-educated and affluent. Money is one of the few things he doesn't seem to worry about. He's proud of his elegant clothes, and he knows how to dress for different occasions. He's clearly a cultivated man as well, effortlessly able to quote various writers. Despite these advantages, he's a powerfully insecure man, and he projects his insecurity onto others, imagining women are making fun of him behind his back and won't understand or care about the things he wants to tell them. The other central character in the famous fragmented poem is the unnamed woman. Prufrock specifically invokes the unnamed woman by referring to her as one. Readers know the person to whom he considers making the startling declaration, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, is a woman because this one is settling a pillow by her head. Her rejection of the statement, not what I meant at all, is repeated as if to emphasize the cruelty of a listener's indifference to such a statement. Prufrock is similarly unable to imagine any women saying anything positive about him. And he seems queasy at the thought of women's actual bodies or faces. He identifies with St. John the Baptist, a biblical prophet. And when he imagines himself as Lazarus, another biblical character whom Jesus raised from the dead even after his body had begun to decay, he's referencing how he'd like to open his heart to the woman he loves about what it was like beyond the reach of the living but he fears her response would be even crueler than beheading him. She might find his story dull and pointless. Prufrock is once again projecting his own emotions onto others. The magic lantern and mermaids are the most meaningful symbols in the poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. In line 105, Prufrock, finding it impossible to explain himself once again, wishes he had a magic lantern to throw the nerves in patterns on the screen. Magic lanterns were the forerunners of slide projectors and were generally used at home. They were simple devices in which a light source behind a transparent plate was used to project the plate's image, painted or photographed, onto a wall or screen. Invented in the mid-17th century, magic lanterns were used until the mid-20th century when slide projectors came onto the market. And back in T.S. Eliot's day, they were extremely popular and could be found in churches, theaters, and homes. The transparent plates that held the images were usually small, but different lenses could be used to make the projected images much larger. In this way, magic lanterns made visible what hadn't been easy to see before. And also at the time Proof Rock was written, nerves and the nervous system were important in both medicine and popular culture. Eliot's creation, J. Alfred Proof Rock, longs for a magic lantern that will let him project his nerves onto a screen for his lover to see that will demonstrate his emotions better than he can explain them with words. The mermaids in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock have significant symbolic weight. Prufrock hears them singing to each other and laments, I do not think that they will sing to me. Prufrock seems more attracted to the fictional mermaids he sees than to the real woman he's trying to pursue. Even when it appears he's underwater with them, he's comfortable and yearns to stay. It's life on land, real life, that seems like death to him. In this poem, the mermaids are entirely unattainable. Prufrock will never have to talk to them. He could never spend time with them in actuality, and this renders them endlessly attractive to him. Living in the chambers of the sea is a more hauntingly beautiful prospect than living in the real world with a real person, but the intimacy he fantasizes about is utterly impossible. Dangerous women, the shame of aging, and the superiority of the imagined life are the key themes in the famous poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. T. 
T.S. Eliot considered titling the poem Proof Rock Among the Women. It's abundantly clear that dangerous women is a key theme of the poem. One interpretation of the poem is that Proof Rock seeks the courage to declare his feelings to a particular woman. Yet he never actually speaks to a woman in this poem. He only imagines speaking to her, and what he imagines is never hopeful. Proof Rock can't imagine any woman saying anything positive about him. He seems queasy at the thought of women's actual bodies or faces and tries to justify his squeamishness by emphasizing women's dangerous qualities. He'd like to open his heart to the woman he loves, but he fears her response would be even crueler than beheading him. Proof Rock is projecting his own emotions onto others. The only women whom Prufrock portrays in a wholly positive light are the imaginary mermaids he envisions living with in chambers of the sea. For Prufrock, that's probably better than if they were real women. For Prufrock, the shame of aging is a source of anxiety. Prufrock seems particularly concerned about his bald spot. He frets that people are laughing at him behind his back. In reality, no one has been making fun of Prufrock but himself. He curses himself for not being brave, and then, piling on the self-hatred, decides everyone thinks he looks old. Prufrock isn't necessarily old, but is Eliot's projection of what it might feel like to be old. To be someone who's no longer attractive, who cannot connect, who's standing at a distance from his own life. In the poem, the imagined life is superior. Prufrock doesn't engage much with reality in the poem, spending it caught up in his swirling thoughts. He does not enjoy obsessing the way he does, and yet he must in some way prefer obsession to action. Although he claims to want love, he can't bring himself to make the effort to obtain it. Prufrock's head is an uncomfortable place to live, but he believes he'd be even unhappier if he tried to express himself and met rejection.